So our first speaker in the Genetics and Evolution Taxonomy and Systematics section is Louis Bernachet from the Université de Laval, who will synthesize 20 years of work on uh, brook char. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you for the kind invitation and all organizers. It's a great, uh, great pleasure to, to be here. It's my first char symposium, actually. Shame on me. Um, so my title was not meant to be a pompous title and talk. It was more about someone being too late in submitting an abstract and not knowing what I was going to talk about. And I just realized that uh, we wrote like 53 papers on brook trout. I had never gave a talk on brook trout, so here's my chance. So see how it goes. Okay, so, uh, so the work I'll be presenting is really embedded into the work we're doing as part of my uh, Canadian research chairs in uh, genomics and conservation of aquatic resources. And uh, the, the fundamental objective of this, um, of, uh, this research program is to increase fundamental knowledge about the evolutionary processes responsible for generating and maintaining genetic diversity within population of aquatic uh, animals. And we aim to contribute to the sustainable maintenance and the long-term economic viability of aquatic species by using this new knowledge into three uh, complementary domains of activity, uh, fisheries, both recreational and uh, commercial, conservation of biodiversity, and uh, aquaculture as well. <laughs> so the, I would say that the traditional view of seeing exploitation, conservation, and aquaculture as has been in general to see uh, these, uh, these domains as uh, three uh, distant planets without much interaction between them. And this over time, and depending on context, has been uh, raised as a source of conflict between conservation biologists, resource uh, managers, and uh, industries. And what we've been trying to promote in the research program of, the, of our uh, Canadian research chair is uh, kind of having a different vision and, and uh, having more like an, an integrative view of the uh, of, uh, common problems between the, uh, the three fields and using uh, arguments uh, such as, in the, as far as genetics is concerned, that these three sectors face similar challenges. The need to maintain genetic diversity and the need to fill the gaps in basic scientific knowledge pertaining to processes that generate and maintain that genetic diversity. So, uh, for, so for, uh, for the talk, basically there's two main purpose. Uh, first is to promote the artwork of my friend Paul Vesey, who's just the best fish illustrator in the, in the whole world. I guess this, everybody will agree for that. And then use uh, the work we've done on brook trout to, <laughs> to illustrate uh, how uh, comp uh, we, um, we address issues pertaining to conservation, uh, fisheries, and, um, and aquaculture and, uh, and uh, make some links between them uh, and, uh, and in the way of uh, uh, promoting a different way to, uh, to see these, these fields and see how each other can uh, contribute to each other. So basically, most of the work I've done on, on uh, brook trout uh, has uh, happened uh, in Quebec. <coughs> so from the con con conservation side, uh, in Quebec we have uh, half a million lakes uh, 4,500 rivers, and uh, most of these, uh, of these uh, water bodies are, are, uh, are occupied, and we find uh, thousands and thousands of wild population of brook trout in these system. And these population uh, exhibit tremendous diversity. We find them in the tiny stream to the largest lakes, in uh, coastal marine areas, and freshwater all over the place, uh, of course, and then uh, towards a, a, a north-south uh, gradient of temperature uh, and climate as well. From the exploitation side, uh, just in the province of Quebec, there's 700,000 permits being sold. And when you count like family permits, that, uh, that means like over a million fishers in the province that goes for brook trout. Uh, so that generates 2.5 million days a year of, of, uh, of exploitation. And uh, as a consequence of that, there's a huge uh, direct economic income uh, of uh, brook trout exploitation over half billion dollar per year. And from the aquaculture side, there's a link with that. So basically, uh, inland freshwater aquaculture, brook trout is the main target for the, for the private producers. And most of the, mar the, 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 most of the market for uh, brook trout aquaculture production is to uh, enhance uh, uh, wild population by intensive stocking. 
So per year, there's over 700 tons of fish that is being produced, over 5 million fish being introduced, <laughs> and that represents over 70% of the private hatchery production and uh, support a substantial number of uh, fishing days with the economy that goes with it. So there's basically an intriguing, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a link between all of that. So you need to, of course, uh, aquaculture, you stock fish to support the exploitation and these two things may have impact on the wild, on the wild population and at the same time you cannot just say, well, we're just going to completely st quit stocking because of the huge economic uh, importance that this activity has by aquaculture itself and in supporting exploitation as well. So you have to, to, to basically to really get new, good knowledge about, about the three aspects and, uh, and find the best compromise in terms of management at the scale of the whole, prom, uh, the whole province. And that's the type, type of contribution we've been trying to make uh, over the years. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk <laughs> through some aspects of uh, work we have done on the three aspects, conservation, exploitation, and aquaculture, uh, presenting some of the, the, the key uh, studies that we have done uh, over the years, starting with conservation. <laughs> so because I had the good idea to put 20 years of research um, in the title, I needed to go back to 1998. Uh, to, with some of what I guess uh, one of our pioneer study using micro satellites <laughs> and that study was performed um, in La Mauricie National Park uh, it was work being done by Bernard Angers uh, co-supervised uh, uh, by Pierre, Pierre Magnan and those were the good days for people that are my age being population geneticists where you could publish in molecular biology and evolution impact factor of nine with five microsatellite markers. Those were the days. <laughs> so basically, at the scale of the park, we uh, saw it a, several, a couple dozen population, and then we realized that these population clusters into, uh, in, in two main population uh, groups like this, and, and uh, the, 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 the level of population structuring among these, among these major uh, branches, and then even among population within branches, was very, very substantial. Uh, just translating these values and that an average FST among these lineages of uh, 0.40 uh, of, uh, of uh, 0.40 or 40 percent of the variance explained by these groupings, which was very very substantial uh, given the scale of the, that park only 500 square kilometers, <laughs> and these populations were uh, split quite well by sub tributaries, but also with a cross river catchment uh, as well. And the main reason for for this very pronounced uh, structuring at the, such a small scale. It just happened that La Mauricie National Park was a kind of a, a, an important contact zone between different glacial lineages that post-glacially recolonized this, uh, this uh, area. So it was kind of a landmark uh, study in the early days of uh, microsatellites. <laughs> so later on, uh, still uh, looking at population genetics, but this time at the uh, intra-lacrustine uh, lacrustine, uh, level with uh, a perspective on uh, adaptive uh, variation. And this was the work of uh, Dylan uh, Fraser, uh, now at uh, Concordia. Uh, Dylan is now a famous conservation biologist and a very, very scary fisherman. If you go fishing with him, you don't catch anything, you catch everything. <laughs> so his work uh, has been done in Lake Mistassini uh, lake Mistassini is one is our largest inland lake in the province. It's 150 kilometers long. It's natural. It's not a reservoir. And uh, basically, uh, so there's brook char obviously in the system. And uh, fish use uh, three main or two main uh, spawning habitats. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, big rivers flowing uh, in the north uh, part of the uh, in, uh, inlet, flowing in the the, the other, uh, northern part of the lake, Cheno and Papas River, and then the outlet of the lake. Uh, the Rupert River uh, Delta in this, uh, in this area. <coughs> so uh, brook trout uh, associated with these, uh, with the, these two uh, main uh, reproductive uh, 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 areas uh, are also uh, morphologically very, very uh, distinct. And <coughs> the, uh, the Rupert River fish being uh, much more um, sturdy with a much larger uh, a caudal peduncle, whereas fish from both Papas and, and, uh, and Cheno uh, uh, are more, much more streamlined, more silvery, <coughs> and a slender, uh, well, slender body in general. So I guess if I would ask you, 
uh, which one you think is the most resident in the mo or the most migrat migratory. So let's say you have to see which one is the most resident fish. Which one would that be? The root water, of course. <laughs> so that's, the, that's the, the, the individual distribution of Rupert fish and Cheno and Pappas within the whole lake uh, during, uh, ca caught by anglers uh, over the summer. And each dot represents a geo-reference uh, position of a, of a fish. And basically, you see that the Rupert River fish uh, just tend to, tend to, uh, tend to are located near the, near the coast, uh, very near the, the, the Rupert River Delta. And whereas the fish from both Pappas and Cheno migrate all, of, all along the lake, and they, se they segregate spatially, but they migrate, if you, you calculate the average distance from the, from the spawning areas, it's much more important for Pappas and Cheno. <laughs> and all of these populations are also ge genetically differentiated with an average FST of 0.08 uh, between the three populations. So Dylan has been, this is not my work, this is Dylan's work, has been continuing working in, uh, on genetic monitoring with the, the Cree people out there. And basically you can use that information <laughs> to track the, the different contribution to the annual harvest of the three main population over time. And from that, uh, you can, then you can estimate the, the, the relative contribution to the uh, angling fishery and, uh, and uh, adjust uh, the management accordingly. So, uh, then still at the, within the conservation and uh, now uh, switching gears. So we went from five microsatellites to 20 microsatellites and now into the uh, more the, gen the genomic era. And we're looking at adaptive variation at the larger scale uh, in the province. <laughs> so this, this uh, project still on, uh, undergoing. We analyze uh, 12, uh, 1,200, uh, 1200 um, fish representing 50 population. Uh, across uh, north-south gradient, but also population from lakes, from rivers, and uh, an anadromous population uh, as well, working with uh, several thousand uh, markers. And uh, <coughs> just to go very quickly, results show that basically there's just a rainbow of population for people that are familiar with that. This is just a, this is just a so-called structure uh, clustering analysis that just clusters fish by their individual fish by their genotypes and different colors uh, represent fish uh, that are part of a given cluster and basically each body of water in our case represent a, a genetically distinct uh, population which uh, more uh, similarity among anadromous popu uh, population. But basically, it just shows that this pop, uh, brook trout at the large scales are also uh, very highly structured. There's no regional structuring whatsoever, so it's largely genetic, and there's no isolation by distance. So it's basi basically those populations uh, are distinct largely by pronounced genetic drift without much uh, migration between them. <coughs> the, uh, the one signal that we found is that there's a reduction of genetic diversity with increasing uh, altitude, which is something that you would potentially expect. Then if we look <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, at, uh, to search for signal of adaptive variation at the genome level, uh, we, can, we can use the uh, uh, redundancy analysis as being used more and more for this sort of analysis. So what we have here is the projection and we're interested at the first step to look for adaptive variation uh, between the three different types of population we had anadromous, um, and lake and river population. And that's the uh, RDE projection of the different population with, uh, with the SNP markers in here. So basically we look for the association between differentiation of population and genetic variation. And we found that about 2.5% of the genetic variation was explained by habitat type. And there were about 100, uh, 170 SNPs uh, that are responsible for this association between habitat and, and, uh, and uh, genotype. <laughs> and with, with this type of analysis, some of the markers you'll have will, will, uh, will, will uh, end up being markers as, uh, found in a, in a given gene. So you may have annotation for some of the markers, but most markers you, you won't. You will not have annotation. But for those markers that we could put a name uh, on the markers, so we found, <laughs> uh, we found these 60-something um, uh, markers that represent different types of, uh, uh, of, of genes or elements. Remarkably, many of those markers that separate the, the fish by habitats are associated with transposable elements. But then we had, the, we had the markers also associated with things 
like bone mineralization, cardio muscle cell differentiation, uh, adult loco locomotory behavior, things that would make some, uh, make some sense uh, that to, to be relevant for habitat use. And it just happened that some of those, mar those markers are found in regions of very low recombination in the genome, which is a, a hint that these regions may be under uh, strong natural uh, selection. So then when we take out a population from rivers and, uh, and an anadromous population, and we look only uh, for uh, adaptive variation uh, among uh, lake population, this is what we have here. So now we have the projection of each individual lake population, <laughs> and again, a distribution of, uh, of the markers, looking for the association between both. And we see that 5% of the genetic variance is explained by the minimum temperature uh, of, uh, of, uh, the po uh, of the habitat of the population, and uh, as well as the degree days uh, of growth for each population. So overall, we have this uh, about uh, 300 uh, markers that are associated with uh, environmental variation, suggesting that these re genome regions may be associated with local adaptation of these populations. And again, for some of those markers, we have names, so that we know in what genes they are, they are found. <coughs> and this time, uh, some of the very interesting targets, the targets are not the same that those that split uh, the different habitat types, but uh, the some of the interesting uh, uh, genes are genes associated with lipid metabolism that could perhaps have something uh, to do with uh, the difference in, uh, in the, the number of days that the fish have to, uh, to, uh, to grow and make energy reserve and so on and so on. So this is still work in progress. We we'll still have to make uh, the, sound, uh, the, the best interpretation of these patterns. But this is the kind of work that is currently going on in population genomics, try to relate uh, variation at the genome level with environmental variation in the search of a uh, signal of local uh, adaptation. So overall, uh, brook trout is a highly structured species at various geographic scales, and there's strong evidence for local adaptation based on both ecological and genomic uh, information. <laughs> so now uh, moving to uh, stocking. Uh, of so uh, stocking in Quebec is the, being done basically by uh, fish that are all derived from a single, what we call domestic strain that was, uh, in, that was developed starting decades ago, maybe down to 100 years ago. And it's basically only these fish that are used by different producers to produce their domestic fish that are used for stocking. <laughs> and of course we know that uh, domestication will lead to genetic differentiation that will, that will lead also to pronounced phenotypic differences between domestic uh, animals and wild animals. And there's two main tracks for that. Uh, first, domestication <laughs> may cause pronounced uh, genetic drift and inbreeding, uh, leading to a reduction of genetic diversity. And on the other side, they're exposed to artificial selection and also relaxed natural selection, and both may lead to genetic differentiation. So then, uh, we can expect that uh, if there's hybridization and introgression, uh, passing some uh, of the domestic genetic backgrounds into the wild and the individual, this may lead to the loss of genetic integrity and loss of uh, local uh, adaptation of wild, of wild population. So now that we can work at the, <coughs> at the, the scale of the genome, we can infer, um, and it's known, and we can infer that actually the patterns or the, the hybridization between and introgression between uh, domestic and wild fish will not happen evenly or in the same way across the genome. So what you have here is an illustration of a wild genome. It's very easy, right? Wild genome. <laughs> but then you have interaction between domestic fish and wild fish. That's, a, that's a, our wild genome again. That's a domestic genome. And then in some areas, basically neutral, where neutral markers are located or neutral areas, you'll have free gene flow occurring or hy free hybridization occurring between domestic and wild fish. Whereas in other parts of the genome, you may have restricted gene flow between the wild and domestic fish because there will be counter selection to integrate uh, ge the, the gen genetic background of the, of the domestic uh, fish into the, into the wild genome. 
And in the other way around, which is another aspect that we have not investigated very often, there's also the possibility that uh, hybridization or introgression may be enhanced in some other part of the genomes if there is positive selection, if there's some advantages to integrate some of the domestic, uh, some of the domestic genetic background into the wild population. So we have been investigating those, those things. <coughs> and that's the starting point of it. So what you have here is just a study based on, on nine population, uh, and that's another study that was published a few years ago using 200, uh, 200 SNP markers, but at that time we were developing markers that we know they were located only in coding genes. So we knew the genes for each of these 230 uh, markers. They were not anonymous uh, markers. And we compare patterns of genetic differentiation among a population, some of them that were, had never been stuck, some that were moderately stuck, and some that were heavily stuck, and we compare the pattern of genetic differentiation among them, and also from the hatchery population. So the main message here is that, is that <laughs> first, there's pronounced differentiation between the, the, the domestic fish, the hatchery fish, and the, uh, and the wild fish when they are not stuck, and then you lose the, and that's the, you have pronounced genetic differentiation among the wild population, just like we saw previously, but you lose this genetic differentiation among wild population uh, when, the, when there's an increase, increasing uh, stocking intensity to the point that population that are heavily stuck, they resemble each other very much and they resemble the hatchery fish uh, very much. <laughs> and that happens because the proportion of the genome that is being introgressed between domestic and wild fish, uh, of course, uh, increase when you go from, uh, from, moder uh, from moderately stocked to heavily stocked fish. So that's what you have here is the distribution of individual fish within different population <laughs> and illustrating the proportion of the, their uh, domestic genetic background. So of course the hatchery fish are basically 100% with, you know, there's noise in the world, that's like type of, uh, of analysis, but basically they're, all of these fish, they're 100% uh, domestic. And then if you look the heavily uh, stocked population, uh, so they're, they're on average, they're, they're, they have a high proportion of the genetic background. And then when you look in moderately stocked population, uh, then <laughs> most of the fish have a proportion of their genetic background, which is domestic, but for the most part, they have a wild uh, gen uh, genetic uh, background. So then, when you, when, then we look at so, uh, that, that part with how the, how the, the introgression pattern differed between different genes uh, between the domestic and the wild fish. So I'm not going to go into the details of explaining this, uh, this, uh, uh, this figure, but it's an anal analysis based on genomic, uh, genomic climbs. And basically, it's a method that can, tell, that can basically <laughs> tell you if the patterns of introgression that you have seen of, of a given marker has happened neutrally or has been counter-selected, or has been positively selected. So for those, that, uh, for those markers that uh, would fit some criteria, for the vast majority, of course, they were called neutral SNPs, but then we had, and then we had slow SNPs, which is basically uh, markers that for which introgression was, was slowed down compared to what should happen neutrally. So the best explanation is that is that uh, uh, hybrid or introgression of those genes uh, is being slowed down by counter selection, but they are also genes for which we observe uh, <laughs> fast introgression, suggesting that perhaps positive selection or there would be some benefit of the wild population to integrate the genetic background, uh, domestic genetic background at the, those genes. <laughs> and then we have names of those genes. And uh, just as a quick example, for example, uh, of these, uh, of these uh, markers that uh, introgress more quickly than expected uh, by just purely neutral process, we had, uh, we, we had markers associated with enhanced growth. So is this possible that perhaps domestic variation controlling growth may have some benefit uh, for the wild population? Of course, this can be contentious. Uh, this is hard stuff to publish. You get uh, criticized by referees. This is heresy, you know, there cannot be anything positive about, but we managed to publish it anyway. It's worth discussing it because <laughs> this is something that is potentially a reality. That is, there may be some positive size on some aspects of, of stocking these fish, but uh, I'm not gonna go too far into that. 
Okay, so domestic and wild fish gen are genetically very distinct. That's the main, one of the main message to get from that. Domestic introgression homogenized wild population, and there's evidence for both slow uh, associated with counter selection and fast introgression associated with positive selection uh, in this uh, system. <laughs> so the second aspect of uh, uh, related with uh, impact of stocking that I wanted to present you is uh, something we just uh, very recently published in the evolutionary application, and it's basically testing if the genetic impact of stocking could be, uh, could be re uh, reversible. <laughs> and the reason why we started that study was that uh, some work we had done on uh, stocking in, in lake trout, and that was not the purpose of the study at all, but it just, it just popped up of the, as an observation of the, of the analysis that we observed that the admixture proportion from the stock fish was decreasing uh, over time with the number of years since uh, stocking was uh, uh, stopped in a, given, in a given lake. So it suggested that perhaps the, 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 the genetic background of the stock fish was kind of vanishing over time, but it was just an observation. <laughs> so we deci decided in Brook, in Brook Trout to formalize that as a, a, a more rigorous study so we studied 29 in some of the uh, uh, national reserve in the province, 29 population, 800 fish using four or 5,000 uh, markers. And we had a very detailed stocking history uh, in terms of number of fish, number of stocking events, mean number of fish, uh, and then when the uh, uh, stocking was uh, stopped in these lakes. Uh, and then we had uh, information on the environmental variables for each lake. <laughs> so the purpose, with, of course, with the um, with the, the genetic, uh, genetic markers, uh, we could uh, estimate precisely the amount of uh, the proportion of introgression for each of the population, as I just showed uh, in, in the previous study. And then the idea was to, uh, to search, for dev of search for a model that could best predict the amount of admixture uh, from the domestic strain that, we, that would be found in the lake uh, given uh, the parameter values for uh, environmental variables, uh, different uh, parameters for stocking intensity, and models that would combine both as, uh, as well. So models were based on beta regression because, <laughs> because the response can vary only between zero and, and one, uh, and then look for the best markers uh, on the, on the uh, AICC uh, criterion, and then validate, validate uh, the selected model using a jackknife uh, approach, basically taking out one lake at a time, rebuild the model, try to predict where that one lake would, uh, <laughs> would be predicted in terms of level of admixture compared to the empirical observation. <coughs> so we ended up with that one uh, best, uh, best model that could explain 56% uh, of the variance in the level of admixture we observe in each of these 29 uh, populations. And basically, there are three terms uh, that were um, contributing to that model. Uh, one, uh, in interaction terms, uh, the size of the, the, sur the surface of the lake with the number of stocking event, the mean number of fish stuck in each stocking event, but for us, the interesting thing of, was obviously the number of years since stocking was, uh, was uh, arrested. So basically, <laughs> the number of years since, we, since uh, uh, stocking was stopped uh, is one of the predictor of what you should expect in terms of the level of admixture in the population. So applying that model to each of these 29 population and keeping those things, uh, <laughs> of course, constant with the values observed for each of the lakes and just playing with the number of years, we could make some prediction of what should be the uh, level of uh, domestic admixture in each of these population uh, over time. And the management, <laughs> uh, the management, the interesting management aspects of something like that is that you could decide, put a totally arbitrary threshold under which you would consider that the lake came back to uh, a level of, of, uh, of natural integrity, if you want. And then managers can use that to say, okay, this is now, this is not a lake that has been spoiled by uh, stocking. It is now a natural lake. Let's not stock it anymore and retain it as a, as a wild population. And this is what they've been doing using uh, that uh, uh, type of predicting model. It's not perfect, but it's an interesting tool. <laughs> so basically, this analysis 
suggest, well, actually showed that at least in brook trout, when you stop stocking, and there's a number of years that goes by, at least in some circumstances, you can have a move and return towards wild genetic, uh, genetic background. I'm gonna uh, finish quickly with uh, something on aquaculture. I'm gonna be very quick with aquaculture. Basically, <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about uh, uh, increasing production and so on, but only making the point that when you uh, work on aquaculture, you can get good money for resource development to, uh, because the main target here is to basically use genetics and genomics to improve production. But in doing so, you get very, interest, well, you get very interesting information on some <laughs> in quantifying uh, genetic parameters that, are very, that can be very important in interpreting phenotypic variation in wild population, understanding the genetic basis of those traits, for example, and predicting what's going to be the, the, the response to selection of wild population. And sometimes those are uh, sorts of things that you cannot easily do uh, by getting funding for working on wild population, but you can get that funding when you work in aquaculture. So we have done that over the years quite a bit. So for example, <coughs> this is just an example of one of the uh, studies we've done with uh, Céline Audet and, uh, and uh, student Amélie Crespel. So basically what we have here is just to show how variable heritability estimates for given traits can be and, how, uh, and what it depends on. So basically we look in, in this particular uh, slide, we look at variation in growth heritability uh, between three different populations. Uh, and then between two environments, uh, rearing environments for each of these two populations. For, so one in, uh, if you want, in an academic experimental environment, and then in the industry environment. And then we look at the change in heritability through time for these three populations in the two environments. So it's very uh, information rich, and that's provided to us a very <laughs> strong basis to understand the heritability of growth. And then we had that for 12 other phenotypic traits. So we, we learned a lot about the quantitative genetic basis of phenotypic variation in brook trout working in an aquaculture uh, context. So and finally, that's the, that's the, final, that's the final point. <laughs> this is um, something we just recently completed uh, using functional genomics, again, in search of understanding the functional genomic basis of phenotypic variation. And again, this type of study is really, really uh, data rich. So what it is, is that we look at genome-wide pattern of gene expression in individual fish, and then we measure many phenotypes, in our case, 15 phenotypes on each of those fish, and then you do some fancy analysis to associate phenotypic variation with patterns of gene expression. So what we have on top here, and so, so the way we address this problem is that we work within a family to reduce the, uh, the effect of genetic differences among individuals, and we phenotype 15 phenotypes on those fish, and we perform genome-wide transcriptome using liver as a tissue. <laughs> so what you have here is the clustering of individuals uh, of this, uh, this family. The two main clusters separate males and females very, very nicely, and even uh, the parents are included in there, and uh, the mom is in the, with, the, with the female progeny, and, the, uh, and the, the dad is with the male progeny. And these odd fish here are just happen to be females with very large liver for some reason, and they just cluster very distinctively. But the point is that there's pronounced sex differences in gene expression, uh, even at a relatively early age, uh, in, uh, in fish. So then what you do with that, you have this uh, pattern of gene expression of thousands of thousands of genes for each individual, and then you perform these uh, analysis of, uh, of uh, gene network analysis to uh, identify cluster of co-expressed genes. So basically you define clusters of genes that vary in expression in the, in the, same, in the same manner, and in doing so you define modules of genes that, that co-vary in expression in the same direction, in the same intensity, if you want, and then uh, we define these uh, module or cluster of co-expressed genes by different, uh, different colors. So then you have a bunch of genes that co-vary in expression, and then the next step is that you look for correlation between variation of these, of these network of expression with each of these phenotypes. So this is a, this is a this correlation matrix 
of variation in expression of these modules of, of genes uh, and between the 15, uh, 15 different uh, phenotypes. And so the color illustrated in red, the, the more red it is, the more positively correlated there is between phenotypic variation of a given phenotype and variation in expression of, the, uh, of a given uh, module represented by different color. So for example, you have here a strong association between this, mod this module and, uh, and the liver weight, and, and then there's a, of course there's a p-value associated with that. And then, for each of these modules, you know how many genes comprise the, uh, are comprising these modules. You know the name of those genes, and then you can know, you can see how much they are connected uh, to each other. <laughs> so, for example, in this module, uh, all the genes are red, so that means that they are positively uh, correlated with uh, the expression of a given phenotype. And the more central a gene is within this network, uh, the more chance there is that these genes will be a hub genes, that is like the central gene controlling the expression of all of those genes. It just happened like in this case, the one in the middle of blue here, uh, in yellow, is a transcription, transcription factor, which is of course the type of master regulatory genes that control the expression of multiple genes. So the point of all that is that you can get into the complexity of genetic interaction, defined module of genes that are co-expressed together, which you would expect when you have a polygenic control uh, on, the, on the, the expression of, of, of phenotypes, and make the associate, association with variation in phenotypes, and then understanding how uh, the, 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 the genome control the expression of different phenotypes. So I'll finish with that. There's no take home message other than <laughs> research on Brook Trar provide the prime example of uh, how research pertaining to conservation, exploitation, and aquaculture can go uh, hands in hands. And I'll finish by uh, thanking so much friends, colleagues, and students that have been involved in these different projects over the years. Uh, Céline Odep has been very, very central to a lot of the, what the work has, have been, I have done on Brook Trout. Uh, Pierre, everybody knows Pierre here. Uh, we've done work together. <laughs> And uh, great uh, former students, Danny Garand, uh, Dylan Fraser, Bernard Ranger, that became faculty uh, themselves, great postdocs, great graduate students. Thank you very much. Okay, we can <clears throat> take a question or so. Luis. Um, so, like, you, you showed that there's possibly some positive natural, like, selection with the crowd and all the stuff with the domestic versus uh, the natural population, and then you showed that after some years, population are coming back as wild. So, how will you reconcile both? As, like, you know... Well, counter selection against well, domestic. Yeah, well, if there's, well, there's a counter selection, but there was also a, a positive yeah, selection, yeah. right? Well, I'd so, say that crow, I mean... The best explanation for that is, that, I mean, you see that you have, a, it would be a slow process of purging, but, but uh, I mean, presumably, there will be traces of that left, and the traces could be stuff that was positively selected to be integrated into the genome. But that suggests that it would be a fairly small part of, uh, of the whole genome that would be, like, positively selected to be integrated into, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it makes sense. It makes sense that these population may, may, may welcome some, some, let's say, gene flow from foreign population because most of these things are like islands, small lake population without contact be, with, with anything else. So there is very pronounced genetic drift. There's, there's tremendous loss of local genetic diversity because they have no option. They cannot get genes from outside, and even domestic background part could potentially be beneficial to some extent. Okay, thank you. I think yeah, sure. uh, just to keep on schedule, maybe yep. we'll, we'll move on.